Marine Corps Marathon. Um, in case you didn't know, this year is the um, 42nd uh, marathon, so it's actually been around for uh, quite a while. Um, I just want to talk a little bit about um, the history of the Marine Corps Marathon, amateur radio's involvement in it, um, a little bit about amateur radio's mission in the marathon, why amateur radio is a part of it, um, a little bit about the different positions that you could um, have if you're going to participate in the Marine Corps Marathon, and also just how to get involved and participate. So um, the uh, first marathon was actually um, back in uh, 1976. It was um, not really, I think it was called the Marine Corps Reserve Marathon at the time. Um, and uh, it didn't have a lot of people in it. Uh, there was only like 1,700 runners involved. And the course was only uh, in Virginia around the area of the Pentagon and the Marine Corps Memorial. Um, the second year they decided to have one, it expanded somewhat. Uh, they had 2,600 runners in it. And this time they actually uh, started including part of DC in it. And then that pretty much has been the course that we've pretty much had for the last um, uh, 40 years that I would guess you'd have to say. And just in case somebody doesn't know, a marathon is 26.2 miles. So um, typically the thing starts over in uh, Northern Virginia. Um, they work their way over, come over into DC, down around Haines Point, uh, Haines Point around the mall, uh, the Capitol, come back across the uh, 14th Street Bridge, go back over to Virginia, and they end up over by the uh, Marine Corps Mem uh, Memorial. Um, so this year, uh, over the years, it's gotten bigger and bigger. Um, because they limit it to 3,000 marathon runners, uh, and there are so many people who sign up to do this because for one thing, this is, uh, they sometimes call it the people's marathon because unlike things like Boston or New York where you have to have a qualifying time in order to be eligible to participate in it, anyone who wants to run a marathon can run in this marathon. Um, you don't have to have run before, this could be your very first time if you want. Um, but since so many people go to sign up for it, they have a lottery so people wow. put in uh, their application and they basically by lottery choose the 30,000 people who get to run in the marathon. And over the last couple of years they've also had like a, a kids fun run that's on Saturday. They've also have a 10k that runs part of the same course as the marathon on uh, Sunday morning. So there's another 10,000 runners that can sign up for that 10k. So that's a lot of people. I mean we're talking about just participants 40,000 people is like more than like the little town that's eight times bigger than the town I grew up in in Pennsylvania. So, you know, there's a lot of people there. So, um, amateur radio, I don't know how many years uh, amateur radio has actually been involved in the, uh, in the marathon. Um, in fact, I'm not even sure when I first did. I came to the area in 84. Probably somewhere around 85 or 86, I probably you know heard about it and signed up and had been uh, involved uh, as a volunteer in the in the marathon. So uh, eventually, um, amateur radio sort of was like a, an adjunct kind of a thing. But over the course of the last several years, it's become integral part of the marathon plan. So, you know, they have this massively huge operating plan because when you think about this, this is a, a major event. It's sort of like almost, uh, the medical people consider it a uh, organized mass casualty because there's just so many people involved, so many things that can go wrong. And so this all is well planned out in terms of how they're gonna organize all these different groups that will be involved. And amateur radio has always been for the last uh, 10, maybe 15 years that I can recall, um, the communications uh, keystone of it. So they depend on amateur radio to provide the uh, communications. I think over the years they've tried, you know, um, the Marines with their you know, military radios, they've tried um, using uh, commercial equipment that gets rented from some company specifically for the purpose, which gets extremely expensive. And, you know, then the people who were involved didn't always know how to operate the equipment. So, They've discovered over the years that amateur radio really understands how to carry this out and it's now an integral part of their operating plan. So the main thing is why we're there is we serve the Marine Corps Marathon Group. So 
what we're trying to do is make sure that we um, act as their eyes and ears on the course. Their goal of the Marines is to the welfare of all the participants, the runners in it. Um, it's not really the, the public that observes it. That's part of the responsibility of like all the public service agencies around, but certainly, you know, we become aware of it and they will try to handle things as, as appropriate. Um, so basically what we do is we send messages so that the people who need medical attention primarily um, will get the attention that they need. And um, so if you think about it, though, this is, like I said, the, the medical folks consider this a planned mass casualty. So it's a very large event. You have um, multiple jurisdictions involved. You have um, uh, DC and uh, Virginia, um, and then several different uh, groups within Arlington, uh, and you know, park police, and the National Capitol Police, and uh, or the Capitol Police and everything else. So there's so many uh, organizations that get involved with this that it's quite an elaborate thing. So getting amateur radio to be part of this large-scale planned event is a pretty significant thing, as well as certainly it's an opportunity to show what amateur radio can do uh, as far as public service. So. I just want to mention <coughs> quickly some of the different positions, and this is where I'm really going to, you know, allow you to ask questions of people who are out there, because um, I think the only positions that I ever um, had, well, oh, for the last several years, the only position I've had has been on net control, so I've been doing that for maybe the last five, six years. But I've been um, out on the course at a mile marker, so that's like the basic thing. We have a radio operator at least at every mile and preferably every half mile. So that means that if something happens on the course, the Marines who are along the course have been told to look for amateur radio operators if they have any issue that they need to report a problem. And the amateur radio operators are pretty well identified by the yellow vest that, that the uh, Marine Corps gives us for uh, operating on, the, on that day. So, you know, you have basically 50 some of those people right there. Um, there's a number of food stations and there's a number of water points. So each of those has an amateur radio operator. Um, there are uh, medical aid stations, and I can never remember numbers very well. I don't remember how many there are. Um, the thing about the medical aid stations is they use um, different modes. They use, they basically, the operator's primary function at the medical aid station is to enter information about the runner who comes into the aid station for assistance into a database so that they can keep track of that. And at the end of the day, if somebody doesn't show up, they know whether that person has uh, come into an aid station, whether they left the race, continued back onto the race. Um, there, um, the other positions like um, net control operator, we have uh, three race nets um, that uh, all the mile markers are spread out across these three nets based on the geography. There's one net that covers all of Virginia and two nets that cover um, the DC side of the, uh, of the course. And then so on those nets you have all your mile marker operators who are in there. You have the um, water points and, and uh, food stops that are in there. Um, each, some of these are divided up into um, districts that are under control of a Marine um, commander. And so we have operators who shadow these division commanders. Now, if you've never done any of the public service events like the local ones, um, a shadow is basically an amateur radio operator who just kind of hangs right on the coattails of the person that they're supposed to provide communications for. Um, you know, it could be uh, race director for a local race. Uh, it could be like these cases, primarily division commanders or top doc who is the chief medical officer in charge of all the medical operations during the Marine Corps Marathon. And ultimately he's the one who's responsible. We're all you know, responsible to them. And uh, he's the sort of like buck stops here type person because he's ultimately responsible for all the medical events that, that occur. And then there are some uh, liaisons. There's like, uh, a uh, race um, command operations center, 
There's a couple operators in there. They're the ones that are interacting with um, all the marine officials, all the public, uh, excuse me, all the police um, organizations that are involved. So if there's any police matters, they get all, they're all together in the same operations center and they can uh, discuss and coordinate. And if any of the information has to go out to the field, then they can relay that through the uh, operators who are at um, the race um, command operations center. And there's also EMS liaisons that are associated with DCMS for the DC side, and Arlington EMS covers the um, Virginia side of the event. So anytime something on the course occurs, if you were at a mile marker and you had a report that there's a runner that needs assistance, then we would send you to the appropriate uh, EMS liaison based on where you are on the course, and they would make the arrangement to come, you know, uh, get the patient and transport them as necessary. So, um, just want to mention a couple of things. So, um, for the most part, most of the places on the course are accessible um, to, because we use repeaters, per minute it's all two meters for the most part. Um, and the uh, operations, repeaters have pretty good coverage, so they um, typically, an HT with a tiger tail, uh, usually will do the job. And there are some places like Haynes Point and some other spots that are maybe a little bit um, not as well covered, so sometimes they may require a mobile rig or they may require you to set up a little temporary antenna. Um, the aid stations, that's kind of like a special thing. I know, Bruce, you usually do an aid station, right? Sure, yeah. They use D, uh, they use uh, digital D-Star, uh, I think on 1.2 gigahertz, right? But that's for the... Uh IP that link back in the day. Oh, okay. There's also a voice now, MedNet, which is just a regular D Star. Yeah. Okay. So. Um, and they also use 9600 watt packet as a backup to that. Right. Right. Yeah. So there's a lot of different modes, but if you've never done one before, the typical ham, even a brand new ham that just has an HT, um, can almost always work out uh, at a mile marker. Um, so. If you, that's all you have, don't worry about, you know, I can't do this because I don't have the right equipment. Uh, when you sign up, and we'll talk about how you participate, um, if you let them know what your equipment requirement, what kind of equipment you have, we'll try to get you assigned to a spot where that equipment will work. And there's always a possibility too. I know I've been willing to lend equipment to somebody else. I think Tom has also offered that. And that's true for any of the local uh, race events, whether it's the um, um, Pikes, Pikes Peak Run or the upcoming uh, marathon, uh, parts, uh, half marathon, um, all those things. You know, if you ever want to participate and you don't have what you think is the right equipment, you know, ask. Uh, I got, I don't know how many radios anymore uh, sitting around, so uh, there's you know more than enough equipment to go around to uh, to lend people. And this is a great opportunity to get people involved in ham radio. I got one young man involved uh, who is a new tech. Uh, haven't touched the radio yet, got him to come out for the Marine Corps Marathon. He's now president of his college's radio club. And he was eyeball deep. And it was just getting getting him over to the hump, if you will, to get started with help. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, go ahead, Dick. You mentioned three uh, nets. Now, all the, uh, when you said net, um, I'm not quite sure what you meant. And I was curious, you're not operating simply at your own through repeaters, and including the D Star. You got a piece there first. So yeah. You're relying on repeaters. Mm -hmm. Now, are the people at the water point, are they just on one repeater system? No. no. Okay. So the, the nets the nets cover the race course itself. The, what I call, what we refer to as the race nets. Okay, so where you are in the course determines which net you're on, A, B, or C. Okay. And what's on one of those nets is basically all the stations the mile markers, the food stops, and the water points that are within that particular area are all together on the same net. So if, a, if there's a problem with a runner, and you know, let's say somebody um, says, um, uh, somebody came up, you know, like I'm a mile marker, you know, 8.0 or something like that, I'm a mile marker eight, okay? So somebody comes up to me, a runner says, hey, there's a runner back there, um, between here and, the, and you know the water stop or something that looks like he needs assistance. So we can then, that person can let us know and at the same time the person maybe at the water spot is the closest person 
um, to also check. So they'll kind of work their way together to see if they can, you know, find out what the problem is, or it may be the operator at 8.5 or whatever. So that's why we kind of have it. So there's at least somebody every half mile, so you're not more than at least a quarter of a mile, but sometimes you're even closer because there's a water stop or a, uh, a food stop close at hand and there's an operator there and they're on the same net, so everybody should be aware of what's going on. Uh, being aware that you're a D-Star operator, they need D-Star operators for the net stations, both voice and digital, because, uh, well, I can provide transportation. Uh, no, I'm not yeah, and, and yeah, actually that, that's a really good point. So. Um, there's, uh, there are, I forget how many aid stations there are, but you know, again, if maybe mobility, you might say, ah, mobility is a problem, but I, I have a D-Star radio, I know how to operate, you know, packet or whatever. You could work at one of the maid stations and you're there all day. And some of those are, I mean, they're in a tent, you know, they're usually pretty protected from the weather. I know the one year that I was at a, an aid station, these aid stations, typically the same people usually work together there a lot of years. I know the one that I was at, like, they had all planned, they brought their barbecue grill, they were, you know, all set to have a regular old, yeah, I mean, they had a regular old, you know, event going on there, the so. The station I was at, I swear I gained a pound in one day because the nurses all had the, the cookies and brownies and cakes they bought. Yeah. Go ahead, uh, Dave. Right, so, I've been volunteering at Mile Marker 15 for, oh, maybe a decade. I actually started, when my son was a running toddler. So what's a safe place? Haynes Point. So you can't get too far lost, you know. Um, and I missed maybe a couple times because of going to conferences. But anyway, mile marker 15 is one of those so-called physiological walls. By the way, it really is a dangerous race because there are people there who shouldn't be running. And I've learned to linger because even though the race is over and they're not pedestrians, they don't follow the rules and they'll collapse in front of you regardless what the rules are. So I like to linger and also I can't leave anyway. But also, to me, as the education guy serves two purposes. One, I like to work with new hams and invite them. And of course, they're like terrified of the idea. Just, no, 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 no. I'll bring as many folding chairs as I have volunteers plus one more because always somebody needs to sit down. Typically a runner or somebody waiting for a runner. Um, the other thing is, it's also a show and tell opportunity. So I'll trot out my 18 foot uh, MFJ and put my GP3 uh, high gain antenna. And I have the mobile radio and the folding table. Of course, I'm walking around with the HT, you know. Uh, but actually, sometimes it's really handy to have a, a 25 watt or a 50 watt mobile radio to actually punch through if you need to. So that's actually, it's come in handy. So, Jack, are you willing? I know I'm putting you on the spot. Your dad is here, so I'm putting your dad on the spot. Would you be willing to wake up four o'clock in the morning and meet us at check-in, and I'll talk to you separately? Yeah. yeah? Sure. Builds character. Okay. But, anyway. David, David, he's got a presentation. So good. Okay. <laughs> so um, <laughs> any any specific questions about the kind of things that people do on the course? Um, any of the positions? Okay. And, and by the way, I just want to mention, so there's um, a couple of dates. So the week before the marathon, there is a um, uh, an all-hands meeting. It's like a big briefing. Uh, you know, it's not mandatory. It's certainly recommended. I heard this year, actually, um, that uh, they discovered a huge stockpile of swag in the Marine <laughs> warehouse. <laughs> and supposedly... <laughs> They may bring all this extra swag to the uh, all hands meeting, you know, and just give it away or something like that. So maybe an additional incentive to come to that meeting. It's on a, on a Saturday before. Um, but anyway, um, there's an operating guide that's very detailed. It's been uh, improved over the years. So you know, even if you've never done that, if you just just read through this guide, I mean, it really is pretty well laid out exactly what your responsibilities are for the different positions and um, how to you know, operate for the day, and all the kind of things you have to think about. They've think, thought about those things. So the nets, the nets cover the race course itself. The, what I call, what we refer to as the race nets. Okay, so where you are in the course determines which net you're on, A, B, or C, okay? And what's on one of those nets is basically all the stations 
the mile markers, the food stops, and the water points that are within that particular area are all together on the same net. So if, a, if there's a problem with a runner, and you know, let's say somebody um, says, um, uh, somebody came up, you know, like I'm a mile marker, you know, 8.0 or something like that. I'm a mile marker eight, okay? So somebody comes up to me, a runner says, hey, there's a runner back there um, between here and, the, and you know, the water stop or something that looks like he needs assistance. So we can then, that person can let us know, and at the same time, the person maybe at the water spot is the closest person um, to also check, so they'll kind of work their way together to see if they can, you know, find out what the problem is, or it may be the operator at 8.5 or whatever. So that's why we kind of have it, so there's at least somebody every half mile, so you're not more than at least a quarter of a mile, but sometimes you're even closer because there's a water stop or a, uh, a food stop close at hand, and there's an operator there, and they're on the same net, so everybody should be aware of what's going on. But anyway, um, there's an operating guide that's very detailed. It's been uh, improved over the years. So, you know, even if you've never done that, if you just just read through this guide, I mean, it really is pretty well laid out exactly what your responsibilities are for the different positions and um, how to, you know, operate for the day and all the kind of things you have to think about. They've think, thought about those things. So and there's two parts to the registration. The hams have their own website that you go through, and that primarily has is, is got more technical kind of input into it, like what kind of <coughs> you know, things like that. And then um, the Marine Corps requires every volunteer, no matter what you're doing, to uh, sign up through their website. So it's a two-step process, and you have to uh, go through both steps. So I'm just going to go through this quickly, and if anybody wants, maybe um, uh, at the end, if you want to come up and register, uh, get um, connected to the Wi-Fi here and we can actually get you um, to sign on and get registered. So, but the first um, part of it is the um, ring, uh, the uh, website for the amateur radio portion is mcmham.org. And if you go there, you end up seeing a screen that looks um, like that. And basically you can, um, lost my cursor. So anyway, um, you just go to the um, place where it says, if you're interested in volunteering, um, click here. So um, you go to that spot right there, and then um, there's two things you can do here. If you've previously participated in the uh, Marine Corps Marathon, then you've probably gone through this in a prior year, and you can just sign back in, and all the information that you've had at the in the past is already there, you just have to review it and update it. If this is the first time, like Jack, for example, you've never done this before, then um, you can do the sign up. So there's two spots there. One says log in if you already had one, um, and then sign up if you've never done it before, and that will create your uh, ID or an account on this uh, on the HAM website. And if you did it last year and you can't remember your password, you click there and it'll send you an email with a new password so you can get logged in. So basically, um, if you've logged in, because I've done it before, they give you the option to verify your equipment list and um, any personal information. They ask you things like, um, you know, your name, your address, uh, your call sign, um, how to contact you, your email address, and order an email address, phone numbers, and what's the best way to contact you on race day. So I'm not going to go through all those screens. If this is the first time you're doing it. Then you click on that sign in uh, sign up button, and you basically get a screen that asks you, and this kind of goes down, it's uh, longer than that, but it asks you all the information that you'd expect them to ask you your call sign. If you're not a ham, for example, um, if Jack's dad wants to come along, then Jack can, um, he can sign up. He puts in Jack's call sign here, and then checks this little box that says, um, He's not a ham, but he's affiliated with one, and he checks that box, and then that way they will know to keep you together. Um, and that goes on to another screen, and um, you have to enter a user, uh, your call sign, which becomes your user ID and uh, password. So once you filled out that big screen, it'll ask you for a password. You get to the end and submit it, 
you'll now have an ID. So what they're going to do is ask you to come in, and this is the same thing that you would do if you were returning from a previous year. You just simply log in. So you'll enter your call sign if you're a ham. If you're not a ham, you enter the email address, and then the password that you sent. And again, you can um, get a reminder if you forgot your password. They'll help you reset it. So on the, uh, I couldn't really get a good screen of the second part of this um, about equipment because I was already registered, so I couldn't see what it was exactly like for a new person. But I can tell you that it's a whole bunch of things that have like buttons that says. You know, here's the kind of equipment uh, you can indicate, like whether you have two meter, 440, um, D Star packet, um, whether you have mobile and HT, whether you have external antenna or just the regular antenna, whether you have any capability of um, extra batteries and things like that. So they can kind of get a sense for where to put you based on the equipment that you have. Um, if you have, uh, go ahead, Vic. I, I suspect we should only put in the equipment that we're willing to, to bring. I mean, you get a lot of equipment. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. But they're looking for the equipment that you're willing to bring to the event that you're going to sign up for. You know? And there's no HF involved in this. They do ask about APRS because there's some APRS tracking that goes on and some other things. So um, The other thing I just want to mention, so if you've done it before, certainly let them know that. Um, and, you know, if you had to always been in a certain position, like, you know, Dave mentions he always does the same place, so he would put that in under um, a special request that he wants to be reassigned to um, that one particular mile marker. If you um, have, like, maybe, you know, you want to, like, Jack and somebody else wants to work together at the same site to split it up, or, you know, two people want to work, you know, husband and wife a lot of times. Uh, will do that, or a parent and a child, they want to be at the same site, they'll put that in a request that says, please pair me up with so-and-so. Um, and if you have a specific place, they'll try to meet that. If you just want to be paired with somebody, but you don't really care too much about the location, they'll look at all the equipment involved and try to uh, put you to the best spot. Um, and the other thing is if you had any specific limitations, like for example, you know, if you, the, the event really starts, um, with check-in can begin as early as 2 a.m. in the morning if you happen to be at a spot that has access restrictions that after a certain point in time, it's closed down and you can't get there anymore. So um, depending on where you are, um, you may be, if it's an early point on the course, you may actually um, be done relatively early or you may go to the very end based on what time, you know, if you're near the, the finish area or something like that. So if you have a restriction that says I can only be there, you know, I have to try to be out by noon or something like that, let them know and they'll try to see if they can work that out. <clears throat> so after you've done the part on the mcmham.org website, which is the part, you know, that's organized and, and handled by the ham uh, group, um, then you have to go to the Marine Marathon website. And that's, as I recall, the last time I signed up, I think after I got to the end of the um, MCM ham one, I think they actually had a link that I just clicked on that took me to the right place. Mm -hmm. So basically, if you happen not to or you miss it, you just go to the um, Marine Marathon website and you scroll to the bottom of that page, there's a little black bar and one of the things says volunteer, so you click on volunteer and you get a page that, you know, talks, it, it's, it used to be a simple page. It's like really all the latest whiz bang stuff. It's like there's lots of stuff on there, and I don't know why, but um, I just found it kind of like overwhelming all the stuff. But basically, just scroll down to the to the um, near the bottom, and you'll find this thing that says uh, current volunteer opportunities. They even have a thing for volunteer opportunities for events that are like in the next year that aren't even available to sign up for, but I guess they want to let people know about it. So the one you want to sign up for is the Marine Corps Marathon, uh, MCM 10K, which is the 10K, and Kids Run. It's considered one big event spread over two days. So you say you want to um, sign up for the Marine Corps Marathon as a volunteer. And you get this uh, other page, you kind of look down there, um, you'll see that there's a, a whole list of things um, under the beginning that says a volunteer with the Marine Corps Marathon. And it turns out the very first event that's on there, or the very first position you can volunteer for is as a ham radio operator. So basically you just check that box that says ham radio operator. Um, you scroll down the page. 
Um, they're going to ask you for your email address, registration information, which again is you know um, your address, contact information. Um, they um, ask you for your t-shirt size, so you got to make sure everybody, so the two things that everybody, well there's three things that pretty much everybody gets as a volunteer at the Marine Corps Marathon. Um, you get a t-shirt, which actually is, is a long sleeve, sort of like mock turtleneck, and it's very nice, all embroidered, it's not one of these like cheap things that's like lightweight, um, uh, screen printed, it's like very nice. And the volunteers all have different ones from the runners and everything, so it's a, a pretty nice thing. Um, you get a credential, um, which you do need, by the way, because that is what identifies you on the course, and that's what, you know, the Marines and other officials who are looking for a uh, radio operator are uh, going to be looking for that credential. Also, you'll have a vest. It's like a yellow fluorescent vest that says Marine ham radio on it. Um, that, unfortunately, you don't get to keep. They have to be turned in at the end. Um, and you do get a uh, box lunch. And actually, I think nowadays, it used to be, depending on your time, you got a lunch and, a, and maybe a breakfast. Now you get both the lunch and the breakfast. Um, so when you um, fill that out, there's one of those like typical government, you know, disclaimer things, which, you know, it's like all the standard things. You have to sign it and you agree to it and then put your, type in your name at the bottom. That's how you sign it. And then you click um, sign up. And then you'll get an email back saying thank you for volunteering. And I think that's pretty much about the last thing you'll hear from them. And everything else that you hear, I, I guess I did get a newsletter from them, but the important stuff that you're going to get is going to be from that first sign-in from the MCM HAM website. That's where all the really important stuff is going to come from, like access to files that have like assignments and this operating guide and frequencies and you know all the stuff that you really need to um, operate during the Marine Corps Marathon is going to come from that MCM HAM uh, website. So that was kind of really the only specific things I just wanted to mention. Um, like I said, if you have any questions, um, you know, I can answer them. If there's any questions about operating an A station, you know, I think Tom has done it. I know Bruce has done it. Um, you know, Dave has been the course for a number of years. Uh, I will say one thing that sometimes new hams might say, geez, I don't know, I've never done this before and I don't feel very comfortable being in a, a position myself. I mean, that's fine. And, if, and if, it's a, if it's a matter of you won't participate versus participating with somebody else, like I know Dave has had a lot of new people come with him, you know, that's fine, then go ahead and do it. But on the other hand, I wouldn't be too terribly um, worried about just saying, yeah, I'll, I'll take a, a you know, mile marker position, especially if you get a chance to do it with like the Parks Half Marathon or one of the other running events that the club provides operators for. Um, the operating guide is far more detailed and actually tells you a lot more than <laughs> we've done for our like regular local events. So um, you really don't need a whole lot of hand-holding in, in my, you know, personal uh, opinion. So, um, if you feel that that's the only possible way you could do it is by pairing up with somebody else and go ahead and do it. But don't hesitate, you know, if you're a new ham, saying like, yeah, I'll give it a try. If, you, if you've checked into the repeater nets and you kind of just generally know how to, how to listen, how to answer when called and things like that, that's the basic thing that you really need to uh, be a good operator during the event. So all the little particulars, uh, you know, will come part of the training. Uh, uh, let me amend that. That's basically right. Tip, new hands are overly enthusiastic and they come with a one bow fong and no second radio and they discover it doesn't work. So if you're a new ham and you, you're brave, ask for equipment, that amateur radio grade equipment as opposed to something else. Um, so that's a word of advice. Yeah. And actually, that's um, so that is true. I mean, it's it's a long day. Um, you know, I I have been net control for a number of years. So typically, we get started right at the very beginning of the day, and um, he does mean two a.m. Huh? And he does mean two a.m. Right. And um, uh, you know, because so you know, 
we need talk-in, for example, to help people get to the check-in place. The check-in place is over in Virginia, but everybody has to go to that check-in place to pick up their credentials, their bid, you know, their meals and all that stuff. If you don't go there and you don't check in, you really can't participate. So that's like absolutely critical no matter where you're coming from. You got to go to this check-in place that's in Virginia and get checked in and then from there go to your thing. So we have, you know, check-in uh, check or talk-in uh, operator who will help people try to get over there if they're not familiar with the area. Um, and then, you know, try to get people to help them uh, get to their uh, location. I'll just mention, and they'll go over this in the you know, Alhamdulillah's briefing, and this is in the um, operating guide as well. But um, I mean, a couple of things to think about. When you start, it's dark out, really early in the morning. Typically, it's cold, and you never can tell what the weather is going to be like. So you have to really prepare for just about anything. I mean, we've gotten out there on a morning where it snowed the day before. <laughs> And so sometimes it's like freezing cold, and then there's been days that's gotten up to like close to 80, which is a disaster for runners, marathon runners. That's way too, even, even 70 is like way too hot. Um, so there's a lot of heat related uh, injuries, and that keeps us really busy. So you gotta kind of plan for that. And also, like, you know, if you're out there for four or five, six hours, you know, your one little battery on your HT just may not last the whole day. So you better plan to have like a spare battery or some way to, you know, recharge it or have a way to operate off of a battery pack. I've seen some people have belt type packs where they carry little six, uh, you know, the little uh, smaller um, like uh, alarm system ties, 12 volt batteries that they can, you know, carry up a couple of those and that's usually enough to keep them going all day. So, um, but again, all those things are all covered in the, um, in the operating guide, like how to figure out how much you know battery power you're going to need for a given you know type radio, considering um, you know how long you're going to be on the air, and that you're mostly operating you know for a great percent of the time is just in listen mode, so you're not really using a lot of power. And again, almost everybody uses low power. We don't actually want stations on the course using high power because if somebody accidentally keys up when they're not supposed to, then they can lock everybody else out. So.